hello uh, very good evening and uh, i hope my voice is audible and you can see my video right uh, let me know in the chat box if my voice is audible and also if you can uh, see the video and the ppt here okay thank you very much uh, we will wait till 6 pm and uh, till more students join and then we will start uh, today's session okay you cannot see my uh, video i mean uh, my face i hope it's visible you can see the ppt right the presentation let me know if you can see the powerpoint presentation okay powerpoint presentation is not also visible this is the powerpoint can you see it okay okay it's fine uh, okay okay it will it will work i think the network is little bit uh, up and down and uh, it will uh, it will be fine wait for some time it will be fine we will start once at 6 pm okay and uh, when other students join then we will start the session hello uh, very good evening can you let me know if you uh, can see the video and uh, the ppt also let me know if my voice is clear in the chat box please let me know if you can see the uh, video and the powerpoint presentation and also if you can uh, listen to my voice clearly the students who have joined let me know if i am audible we will wait till more students join and then we will start
Okay, so I will wait for uh, two to three more minutes and I will start. So, very good evening to all of you. Uh, we will wait for uh, two to three more minutes, uh, let other students join and then we will start today's session. Meanwhile, let me know if uh, my voice is audible and uh, if it is clear and also let me know if you can see the PowerPoint presentation clearly. We will start shortly, so please wait. Let few more students join and then we can start the session. Okay. So, uh, what I will do is I will just make the meeting open so that students can join easily. Okay. So, let me start with the introductions. I think uh, eventually the students will join. So, hello, very good evening. Uh, my name is Moshumi Dev and I am the PMRF fellow from the organic uh, from the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology IIT ISM Dhanbad. I am your TA for this NPTEL course of uh, Organic Chemistry in Biology and Drug Development. So, as all of you know, it is a 12 week course and each week uh, we are having one uh, course particular topics as a course content. Along with that, we have a weekly live session for 2 hours right on every Monday from 6 pm to 8 pm. So, what we will do in this live session, we will solve questions in this live session. We will solve the MCQ questions. These type of MCQ questions are given in your assignment every week. So, as you all know uh, uh, that uh, there is a weekly assignment on the SWAM portal on the course page and each week you have to uh, submit the assignment on a particular deadline and uh, this uh, assignment will have contain some marks which will be added to you in the final certificate uh, portion. Okay, so, you have to participate in this assignment uh, in the portion very uh, correctly. I mean uh, properly and uh, because uh, to help you to solve with your assignments, this live sessions will be held. Okay. Uh, so, uh, today it is the week two, uh, 2 live session of our course of organic chemistry in biology and drug development. So, before starting I would like to uh, emphasize on few points. So, this there will be this kind of problem solving session uh, every week and the session will be on every Monday. Uh, from 6 pm to 8 pm. This is a 12 week class. So, we will have uh, like 12 live sessions for this uh, course uh, on this for this NPTEL course uh, along with uh, one last summary session where I will summarize the whole course content before just before your examination. Okay. And these sessions will be live on Google Meet platform. Uh, the main point is like if any kind of network disruption happens for, from my side. Uh, okay. So, please wait for few minutes. Do not leave the session in between. I will join as soon as possible. So, please do not leave. Okay. And if there is any network issue from your side, you can uh, just uh, leave and join, rejoin at any time as uh, as you have, uh, I think you have noticed that I have muted you all and also I have kept the cameras off since I am recording the session. Okay. So, I am recording the session, I will upload it after the class and you can just go through the meta meta this video after this class also. Now, if you have missed anything in, um, in between because of the poor network connection, you do not have to worry. So, during the session, you can con, uh, you can communicate with me through the chat box. Okay, the chat box is open all the time. I am uh, I am looking into the chat box uh, every now and then. So if you have any doubt, any query, anything, you can let me know through the chat box. Okay. So the, for the smooth uh, recording of the session, I have muted you all, and that's why. But uh, the chat box is always open, and I am monitoring the chat box. So if you have if you have any doubt, any query, you want to tell me anything regarding the class, regarding the course, you will please let me know in the chat box. And after the class, if still the doubt persists and uh, if you have any problem, any question, anything, you can reach me through the email. I will share my email ID at the end of the session. Okay? And this presentation which I am showing today, this presentation along with this class recording will be shared to you. So, I think I have shown you earlier also where to find this problem solving session and uh, at the end of the class, I will again show you where to find this problem solving session video and also the PPT. I think uh, many of you have find it all already. And uh, so, at the end of the session, I will show you once again where to find this uh, lecture video and the PPT. Okay? 
So, this was uh, the briefs before this class. So, I think uh, sufficient students have joined. So, I can start the session, right? Uh, I hope my voice is audible and also you can uh, see the presentation. Let me know if you cannot see the presentation or if uh, there is any problem uh, from my side. So, please let me know. So, today it is our week 2 live session. So, in the last day, it was our week 1st live session. What we had done? Like we have completed week 1 and week 2 of course content, right? So, right now the week 3 course content is live and the week 3 assignment has been also released in the SOAM portal which you have to submit next. Okay. So, today what we will do is we will uh, solve the questions from week 3. So, today I will show you 20 questions from the week uh, 3 course um, content. These 20 questions will be MCQ, it will have 4 options okay, and there will be one correct option. After I, sh I am showing you one question, you have to identify which of the following options is the correct one and you have to let me know in the chat box. You have to write in the chat box which of the following A, B, C or D of the particular question is the correct one. I, after showing the question, I will wait for some time. I will check the answers given by you and then after that I will show you the particular uh, right answer and we will discuss that particular topic. That is how we will uh, discuss the course content and also we will solve few kind of problem solve, uh, question answer so that it will be helpful for you uh, for solving the assignments also. right? So, uh, let me first show you what is the course content of week 3. So, week 3 course content comprises of these topics. So, first we will start with the hierarchical structure of proteins, the secondary tertiary quaternary structure, the Ramachandran plot and protein purification techniques. Then protein purification techniques it will be continued and we will uh, move on to the introduction of uh, enzymes and its kinetics, enzyme kinetic catalyzed reaction and introduction to catalytic activity of proteases. So, this is the course content of week 3. So, today we will have 20 MCQ questions. After I show you one question, I will give you some time. You have to solve that particular question. You have to try to answer that particular question. Even if your answer is wrong, do not you have to do not uh, have to worry because uh, we will not give you any marks based on the class uh, answering. Okay, But if you answer, it will be better for you and also for me because I will understand that you are understanding the topic or not. Okay, So, try to answer the question once I show you. And even if your answer is wrong, there is nothing to worry. So, please participate. Okay. So, now I will uh, move toward to the question answer session. Okay. So, I think everything is fine. Yeah. So, now let me start. So, now I will show you the first question of today's session. So, the first question of today's session is the problem number 1. It says, what are the primary stabilizing forces of alpha helix and beta uh, sheet structure? Okay. The option are number A hydrophobic interaction, number B hydrogen bonding interaction, number C covalent interaction and number D disulfide bond. So, I think the question is a little bit or uh, there is a wrong because it is uh, the single stabilized force you have to identify there will be only one correct answer. Okay. But the stabilizing force is same for both alpha helix and beta uh, st sheet structure. So, you have to identify the correct stabilizing uh, force of the uh, alpha helix and beta sheet structure of the protein. So, in our first class, we have discussed about the amino acids, how the peptide bonds are formed, what are the primary structure and uh, all the techniques to identify the primary structure and the uh, protein uh, peptide bond, the sequence of amino acids and all. We have discussed about isoelectric points and everything. And so, today what we will discuss is about the higher uh, structures like the secondary, tertiary and uh, so on uh, structures of the protein. So, this question related to the secondary structure of protein which says that the, uh, you have to identify the correct primary stabilizing force of alpha helix and beta sheet structure. Your options are number A hydrophobic interaction, number B hydrogen bonding interaction, number C covalent interaction and number D disulfide bond. Which of the following is the correct one? I will give you 2 minutes, then I will show you the correct answer and we will discuss about the alpha helix beta uh, sheet structures of the protein.
I want all of you to participate even if your answer is wrong it does not matter but you should participate in every question that's how I will understand that if you are listening to me or not if you are uh, following the lectures or not so try to answer it let me check the chat box if there are any answers okay so i think i have few answers number d number b number a someone say, says rajeshri says that is hydrogen bonding interaction then we have t okay so i have multiple answers in this question others i want all of you to participate okay let me check which of the following is the correct one anybody else wants to answer okay so now i will show you what is the correct answer and then i will discuss it so the correct answer the primary stabilizing force of alpha helix and beta sheet structure is number b hydrogen bonding interaction so first we let, to, uh, let us understand what are the alpha helix and beta sheet structure. So basically these are known as the secondary structure of the protein. So secondary structure of the protein consists of regions of ordered structure adopted by the protein chain. In structural proteins such as wool and silk, secondary structures are extensive and determine the overall shape and properties of such protein. However, there are also regions of secondary structures in most other proteins. There are three main secondary structures that are alpha helix beta pleated sheet and beta turn. So alpha helix, this is alpha helix structure. So it results from the coiling of the protein chain such that the peptide bonds making up the backbone are able to form hydrogen bonds between each other. These hydrogen bonds are directed along the axis of the helix as shown and in the figure number this one, num this figure. The side chains of the component amino acid sticks out to the, um, uh, to the uh, right angles to the helix thus minimizing the steric interaction. So as you can see the hydrogen bonds are inside toward the axis of the helix if it is a helix this is the axis in between okay and the hydrogen bonds are there as you can see the hydrogen bonds are in between the carbon and carbon of one amino acid and the um, NH bond of the next amino acid and the side chain the R's they are directed outside the helix okay and that is how they, um, since they are outside the right angle to the helix uh, that is how now what happens that particular steric interaction or the steric uh, repulsion these are minimized. Other less common types of helixes are uh, known as the proteins such as 3, 10 helix which is more stretched than the ideal alpha helix or and pi helix which is more compact and extremely rare. So alpha helix is the most common one and uh, as you can see the primary stabilizing force here is the hydrogen bonding interaction between the carbonyl carbon of the carbon then oxygen and the NH of the amide peptide bond right. And then we have the beta pleated sheet. So beta pleated sheet is the layering of the protein chain one um, uh, on top of another as you can see in this figure okay here too the structure held together by hydrogen bond between the peptide chains the side chains are situated at the right angles to the sheet once again to reduce the steric interactions as you can see this is a sheet like the page of the book as you can uh, assume it to be so if it is a page of a book so what uh, will happen this amide with the peptide bonds are on the page and the arts the the, uh, the side chains are above the beta pleated sheets okay that's why that's how it minimizes the steric interactions the chains of the beta sheet can run in opposite direction anti parallel or in the same direction and here also the primary stabilizing force is the hydrogen bonding interaction and then we have the beta turn so beta turn is basically now when the in the beta pleated sheet as you can see the hydrogen bonding that uh, the one and the then other the hydrogen bonding are alternative but in the beta uh, sheet what happens the hydrogen bonding happens between first and third um, of the peptide bond so as you can see here in the peptide bond this is the first this is the second this is third so as you can see here not the first and third are uh, bonded to each other but in when what will happen if the first nh will interact with the third carbonyl carbon it there it will create a bend which is known as the beta turn or beta bend we will discuss the beta band uh, uh, again in later of our slides 
So basically remember uh, that the secondary structures are mainly of two type alpha helix and beta pleated sheet and we have less common beta turn also and all in this all three things the primary stabilizing force is the hydrogen bonding interaction ok. So am I clear? Do you have any problem in this first question? If you have any problem, you can let me know. So, in the chat box, the chat box is always open, right? So, if you have any problem at any point of the class, let me know, okay? I will try to solve it uh, in the class and if I cannot solve it in the class, I will uh, answer you through email or we can discuss it in the next class also, okay? But uh, let me know as soon as you uh, counter a problem, let me know in the chat box. So, I think it is clear. Now, I will move toward the next problem. So, problem number 2, it says that which amino acid is incorporated into the polypeptide chain to induce flexibility and which amino acid is termed as helix breaker. Your options are number A, alanine glycine, number B, glycine proline, number C, proline glycine, number D, histidine and proline. So, you have to identify the amino acids respectively. Which amino are the first ones? So, basically the for the options are for amino acid incorporated into the polypeptide chain to induce flexibility and the second amino acid options are given for the which amino acid is termed as helix breaker. So, you have to identify the correct option, the correct set of amino acids which are induced, uh, which induce flexibility and which is termed as helix breaker. Again I will give you 2 to 3 minutes, think and try to answer the question. All of you please participate, even if your answer is wrong it does not matter. But uh, whatever you think is the correct option, let me know. Which of the amino acid incorporated into the polypeptide chain to induce flexibility and which amino acid is termed as a helix breaker? Your options are number A alanine glycine, number B glycine proline, number C proline glycine and number D histidine proline. Let me check the chat box now. Okay, I have few answers. So, number C, number as for proline and glycine, number C, number A. Okay, I have again multiple answers. Let me check which of the following is the correct one. So, the correct answer will be number B, glycine and proline. So, 
So, as I have told you to look at the options very carefully, the first option is given for the uh, amino acid which induce the flexibility and the second one as the helix breaker. So, glycine is the amino acid which in induces flexibility in a polypeptide chain and the amino acid proline it in is termed as a helix breaker. So, basically what happens there is in when in the alpha helix if you have proline, so proline is a amino amino acid ok. It does not have any NH after forming the uh, peptide bond. So, it cannot participate with the uh, hydrogen bonding with the amide NH. So, that is why what happens whenever there is a uh, proline in the helix, the helix is become distorted and we have which is known as a H. So, that is why this proline is known as a helix breaker. So, as you can see it is the alpha helix ok and this is the in the alpha helix uh, after in the each uh, turn is uh, in about, about uh, 5.4 Armstrong and there is 3.6 residues in each turn ok and this is the Boran stick model of the alpha helix that is how it looks in the 3 dimensionally. So, proline and glycine are exceptional amino acid, glycine does not have any substituent ok. So, the structure of glycine as we all know what is the structure of glycine? So, glycine is the amino acid which does not have any aliphatic side chain or anybody said it has only hydrogen the R is the hydrogen in case of the glycine and we have the NH2 here and the carboxylic acid. So, since there is there are uh, no uh, I mean uh, side chain it is only hydrogen. So, it is very more flexible ok. So, whenever you want flexibility in a polypeptide chain you have to incorporate glycine. You will see that at flexible in the flexible region of a particular polypeptide chain there are glycines. And if you want to bring rigidity means if you want to disrupt this kind of system which is stabilized by intramolecular hydrogen bond. So, this is very important that the systems are in, uh, involved intramolecular hydrogen bond. So, already we know in there are two type of hydrogen bond intramolecular and intermolecular. Intra, intra means in between ok, this in the same polypeptide we have the hydrogen bonding and inter means if there are two different polypeptide chain and they have a particular interaction it will be called intermolecular interaction and then incorporate proline since proline cannot participate in hydrogen bonding. So, what is the structure of proline? So, proline has a very different structure, it has a cyclic imine structure means it has a secondary amine. So, this is the primary amine all of you right, no. Uh, so, this is a normally in the amino acids have primary amine only exception is the proline which have a secondary amine. So, the proline structure is like this, so, there are hydrogen I am not uh, writing the hydrogen here and I am also skipping the all the uh, special formulas. So, this is the structure of the proline. So, the proline is known as a helix breaker, it breaks the helix. So, if some protein is going to have a helical shape and suddenly changes another shape at the change of a point proline may be present because proline is one which does not allow any helix formation. Now, apart from this uh, alpha rigid and um, alpha right handed alpha helix there are another one which is called a beta sheet. So, I have discussed the beta sheet uh, in the earlier uh, thing right. So, remember glycine is the amino acid which induces flexibility in a polypeptide chain and proline is one which is in no, known as helix breaker which breaks the helix ok. So, any doubt in this question? Let me know if you have any doubt or any problem in this particular question number 2. So, whenever I am showing you a question after showing the answer if you have doubt let me know then and there. So, I can repeat that ok. So, I think question number 2 is clear for all. The proline and glycine was the correct answer, but the option was B because I think you have just confused in this, this uh, two, okay? Yeah, okay, okay, fine. So that's why I have told you that reading the question is very carefully is very, uh, I mean, important. I mean, uh, sometimes it may happen that you know the correct answer, but you you have not uh, read the question very carefully, and you may make, make a mistake. Okay, so don't worry, it will be fine. So, now I will show you the next problem. So, let us move on to the problem number 3. So, the problem number 3 says according to Ramachandran plot which region is sterically disallowed for all the amino acids except glycine. Your options are number A red region, number B yellow region, number C white region, number D all of these. So, according to Ramachandran plot which region is sterically disallowed for all the amino acids except glycine try to answer this question. Once you try after that I will show you what is the correct answer and we will discuss about the Ramachandran plot and the all the notations what does that notations mean. 
according to Ramachandran plot, which region is sterically disallowed for all amino acids except glycine? According to Ramchandran plot, which region is sterically disallowed for all amino acids except glycine? Let me check the chat box. Okay, number A, number C, okay, it's C, white sterical disallowed number C. So, all the three answers which I have got is saying it is number C. Others also please participate, okay. Uh, it will be helpful for you only that if you participate in the class, okay. So, C is the answer given in the chat box. Let me check if C is correct or not and then let us discuss about Ramchandran plot. So, the correct answer will be yes, it is number C white region. So, let us first understand what is the Ramchandran plot. So, the Ramchandran plot looks like this. Okay. So, a Ramchandran plot also known as the Ramchandran diagram or the uh, Phi and Shai plot. It is originally developed uh, in 1963 by G. N. Ram Krishandran. So, white region. So, as you can see, this is a, this kind of plot. This is the this is the particular Ram Chandran plot. We have four different different region, right? And this four different region have different different colors. So, uh, there is white, red, and yellow color. So, the white region is the sterically disallowed for all amino acid except glycine. Red region or allowed region, namely a, a helical and B sheet conformation, and the yellow areas are the outer limits. Okay. And as you can see, there are two different different uh, I mean uh, angles, which is one is called the phi and another is one is called the shy. So, what are the phi and shy? So, uh, the Ramchandran plot provides an overview of allowed and disallowed regions of torsion angle values. It serves as an important indicator of the quality of protein three dimensional structure. Torsion angles are also known as the dihedral angles. So, these are among the most important local structural parameter that control protein folding third possible torsion angle with the protein backbone is called omega. So, what is omega? Do you do not have to worry about the omega one. So, there are two torsion angle mainly one is phi and another one is shy. Okay. So, uh, the rotation of the polypeptide backbone around the bonds between N C alpha 
and uh, for the nitrogen and C alpha. So, this is the alpha carbon with which the R or the side chain is attached. Okay, the angle, the um, torsion angle or the dihedral angle between the nitrogen and car uh, alpha carbon, it is known as the phi and the torsion angle or the um, dihedral angle between the carbonyl carbon, uh, so carbonyl carbon and the um, C alpha, this is known as the psi. Okay, and it provides an easy way to view the distribution of torsion angles between the protein structures. So, what is the significance of the Ramachandran plot? Ramachandran plot was the first verified tool for protein structure. It displays the dihedral angles or the torsion angles phi and psi of all residues. It is a very powerful tool to identify errors in the protein structure. It has become a standard tool to determining the protein structure and in defining secondary structure in terms of the alpha helices and beta sheet contents. It allows the display of distribution of residues in the protein in terms of their phi and psi angles. The region in the plot helps to identify residues that are allowed and disallowed regions of the Ramchandran plot. So, what you have to remember what are the different different regions of Ramchandran plot, what are the allowed region, what are the uh, what are regions are not allowed, what are the parameters, what is psi and what is phi you have to remember these things from the Ramchandran plot and also the significance of Ramchandran plot is very important which you have to understand and which you have to remember. Okay? So, I think it is clear. I think uh, I have got uh, three answers and all the three answers has said that it is the number C. So, I hope problem number C in the Ramchandran plot is uh, some sort of clear to you. Just you have to remember what is the parameters, what is phi, what is psi and you have to remember the regions. Okay? And also remember the significance of the Ramchandran plot. So, this was the problem number 3. Now, I will move toward the next problem. So, problem number 4 says, which of the following statements is not true for beta bands? Your options are number A, hydrogen bond stabilizes the beta band structure. Number B, proline and glycine are frequently found in beta terms. Number C, it occurs at protein surfaces. And number D, it gives a protein linearity rather than globularity. So, you have to find out the statement which is untrue, which is not true regarding the beta band. Wherever there, whenever there is a question about this true, false, uh, correct, incorrect, please read the options very carefully because most of the students do mistake in this part. Okay? So, read all the four options very carefully and let me know in the chat box which of the following you think is the statement which is not true regarding beta bands. Beta bands are same as the beta turn which I have discussed just in the first question itself and here I will discuss it in more detail also. So, read the options carefully and let me know. Which of the following statement is not true for beta bands? Number A, hydrogen bond stabilizes the beta band structure. Number B, proline and glycine are frequently found in beta turns. Number C, it occurs at globe protein surfaces. And number D, it gives a protein linearity rather than globularity.
let me check the chat box i hope i will find some answers for this question again okay i have few answers so number d number d and number a so i have two number d and one number a okay let me check which of the following is the correct one number d or number a or any option else so the correct uh, answer for this question the statement which is not true regarding beta bands is number d that it gives a protein linearity rather than globularity so beta bands as i have discussed it permits the change of the direction of a peptide chain to get a folded structure it gives protein globularity rather than linearity hydrogen bond stabilizes the beta band structure and uh, the proline and glycine are frequently found in the um, beta band so beta turns beta turns are often promote uh, the form formation of anti parallel beta sheet it occur at protein surfaces and involve four successive amino acid residues so basically this is the structure of beta band this is the type 1 and this is the type 2 so more or less it is a similar only the, the difference is that the direction of this carbonyl carbon is here that is inward and this is the it is the outward and this is the a beta turn allows the polypeptide chain to turn abruptly and go to the opposite direction this is important in allowing the protein to adopt more globular compact shape the hydrogen bonding interaction between the first and third peptide bond uh, is uh, of the turn is important to stabilizing the turn and less abrupt change in the direction uh, of the polypeptide chain can also take place through the longer loops which is less regular in their structure but often rigid and well defined so this uh, statement number d which says that it gives protein the protein linearity rather than globularity is false because beta turn indeed it provides the protein with a globularity or a globular shape rather than the linear shape okay it disrupts the linear shapes now i will move toward the problem number 5 so if you have any doubt any query at any point please let me know if you do not understand a particular question i will repeat it uh, then and there okay then problem number 5 which says that which of the following protein purification process is not based on the charge your options are number a sds page number b ion exchange chromatography number c native gel electrophoresis and number d isoelectric focusing so which of the following protein purification process is not based on the charge option a sds page number b ion exchange chromatography number c native gel electrophoresis and number d isoelectric focusing again i will give you some time i will give you 2 to 3 minute think and let me know which of the following will be the correct answer which of the following protein purification process is not based on the charge is this page ion exchange chromatography native gel electrophoresis or isoelectric focusing so now let me check the chat box if there are any answers for problem number 5 
okay i have the answers like it says number c then number a sds page and then number d also so okay only three persons are answering so i want all of you to participate okay uh, so all who are present in the class who are listening properly please answer the questions so since i have uh, seen that there are three different answer for this question one is i think number a then we, i have also the number d so let me check which of the following is the correct answer for problem number 5 so it says which of the following protein purification process is not based on the charge so the correct answer will be number a sds page so sds page is the technique which is not the purification the separation does not uh, is not based on the charge so let me uh, sh discuss so generally sds means uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate okay so basically it is a long uh, chain of the hydrophobic chain which have a negative charge okay and uh, the sds page the food form is the mm, uh, your uh, sodium dodecyl uh, sulfate sds and page is the polyacrylamide gel mm, uh, electrophoresis it is also known as so what happens to here that this particular um, sds is negatively charged okay so the proteins it may have positive charge may have negative charge as you can as you know the few amino acid they are positively charged few amino acid are the negative charge so based on the side chain present the protein may have positive or may have negative charge so there is a no constant size and charge relationship uh, which we need that is why we add the sds to the particular polypeptide chain and it has a negative charge and binds to the protein evenly so the, there is a and keeps the protein linear so what happens there is a direct charge and length relationship now any natural charge it will get overpowered by the charge coating it gets from sds so um, although it may have some positive some negative charge but once we charm, uh, we coat the particular polypeptide chain with sds what happens it, it converts to the negatively charged so now we use the charge to send through the polyacrylamide gel mesh so this is a mesh which is have a polyacrylamide gel and it has a particular uh, electrode uh, like positive and negative charge so since this is a particular sds is a negatively charged okay the polypeptide chain now it will move toward the positively charged electrode now why i have uh, to, um, told that it is not based on the charge because all polypeptide chain so suppose there are four different polypeptide chain so all the four polypeptide different polypeptide chain will have the negative charge once we use the sds so why how the separation will happen so the separation will happen based on the particular the molecular weight and particular size of the polypeptide chain so longer things get tangled in the mess and it will move slowly so the polypeptide chain which are bigger in size it will tangle more uh, intensely into the particular polyacrylamide gel mess and they will move slowly in the particular this with that uh, gel okay and the smaller and uh, the smaller polypeptide chain they will travel faster okay and they will uh, reach to the particular uh, and the, by based on the size based on uh, this particular separation happens not based on the charge because once we coat with sds all the polypeptide will have the negative charge but the separation happens uh, depending on the size because the bigger the size is it will move slowly and the smaller size it will move uh, fast and that's how uh, the separation happens okay and then uh, after at the end of the separation you have to turn off the power so that it uh, don't move further okay after the separation so the, the remember that the sds page is a purification process which is not based on the charge so now uh, if it is clear i will move toward the next point meanwhile if you have doubt let me know in the chat box i will solve it at the end of the session or in between okay so i think it is clear till now anybody has any problem so i hope it is fine so i will move toward the next problem so the problem number 6 it says that which of the following statements is false for the gel filtration technique your options are number a it is also called size exclusion chromatography number b chemical polymers can also be separated by this technique number c small size protein will elute first followed by big large size ones and number d different sized cut off gels are used to separate the proteins which of the following statement is false regarding the gel filtration technique your options are number a it is known as the size exclusion chromatography number b chemical polymers can also be separated by this technique number c small size protein will elute first followed by large size one and number d different size cut off gels are used to separate the proteins 
again I will give you uh, 3 to 4 minutes, think, read the options carefully and let me know in the chat box which of the following you think is the correct answer. So, which of the following statement is a gel uh, false for gel filtration technique? Let me check the chat box. Only one answer. Okay, one answer I have it is number C. Okay, let me check if number C is the correct one or not. So, the statement which is false for gel filtration technique will be very good. The student who have answered it, one student have answered it correctly that it is number C. Small size proteins will elute first, followed by the large one. This statement is the false. Okay, it is not correct. So, now let us first understand what is the chromatographic technique. So, basically uh, chromatography encompasses of a variety of techniques that involve a mobile phase flowing through a bed of stationary phase. A mixture of solutes is resolved and or separated as a result of such differences in affinities of the solution for the mobile phase relative to the stationary phase. A solute that has more affinity to for the mobile phase move forward with the mobile phase whereas, the solute which has more affinity for the stationary phase it is retarded. So, these the solutes are uh, separated into the bands based on their distribution between phases. Molecules of biological interest are separated by resolved um, or resolved by variety of chromatography techniques including absorption chromatography, ion exchange chromatography, partition chromatography on paper or thin layer chromatography, gas liquid chromatography, molecular exclusion chromatography, molecular sieve or gel filtration. Chromatography it involves a mobile phase which can be a liquid or gas flowing over a stationary phase which can be a solid or liquid as you, you can see ok there is a solute and there is a stationary phase is a circle circular one it is the stationary phase it can be solid or liquid and mobile phase which is M it can be liquid or gas mm, uh, and uh, the, mm, uh, the, the mixture of solute is separated based on the solute components degree or affinity toward the mobile or than the stationary phase. If component 1 has a stronger affinity for the stationary phase, then component 2, then component 2 will migrate through the column rapidly than component 1, okay. 
So, now let us come to the uh, particular gel filtration chromatography which is also known as a slice exclusion chromatography. So, basically gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography it depends on the size of the particular uh, protein molecules ok. The molecules the peptide molecules or the protein molecules the size of the molecules is basically uh, the uh, way which through which we will uh, separate the things ok. Uh, so, how it happens? So, basically this is the stationary phase ok. And then the stationary phase are porous molecules and uh, if the particular protein is small in size, so what will happen? The small protein will enter to the pores of the stationary phase and it will bind strongly with the stationary phase. Now, when there is a large molecule, the, the large molecule uh, it cannot bind with the stationary phase because it will not get fit into the pores of the stationary phase and it will stay in the solution phase only ok. So, whenever there is a mixture of a large and uh, smaller size protein and large size protein. So, what will happen? The small size protein will bind strongly with the stationary phase and it will stay intactly into the column, but the large size molecules so due to their inability uh, to enter the pores they will move toward the particular solution phase and they will elute first from the particular column. So, the retention time is less for the large so retention time is known as the time uh, through which this particular uh, protein stays into the particular uh, column ok and uh, the retain uh, that is why the first the exclusion will be for, for large size ion and then after large size ion the small size ion they it will get eluted. So, this is the difference of the size it is a uh, separation happens in the size exclusion or uh, chromatography or gel filtration chromatography. Now, let me ask you that uh, if you are given 4 or 3 or 4 different proteins when you are given the size of the protein or the molecular weight of the particular protein and you are asked to identify how it will elute. So, you now you know that the larger the size uh, so it will elute first and the smaller the size or the uh, low is the molecular weight it will elute later in the last position ok. So, this is known as the size exclusion is all about the gel filtration chromatography and I hope it is clear. If you have any doubt let me know I will repeat it ok. So, is it clear or not? In the chat box let me know ok you have understood right what is the size exclusion chromatography. So, if you have any doubt any problem you can let me know ok. So, that is how this, this is not only for the size exclusion on one. So, in basic chromatography it is the technique, the chromatography will be there will be two particular uh, phase, one will be stationary phase which is uh, the stagnant phase and one will be mobile phase which can be a liquid, a solvent system and anything. And the compounds if it has more affinity toward the stationary phase it will stay by strongly bind to the stationary phase and it will not uh, move to, uh, into the solution phase and that is how it happens ok. So, remember in gel filtration or size exclusion chromatography the separation is based on their size. Okay. So, now I will move toward the problem number 7. So, seventh problem of our session is it says that in an ion exchange chromatography if the column is negatively charged then which of the following statement is true? Your options are number A proteins with P i is less than P h will um, of the buffer will elute. Number B proteins with P i is greater than P h of the buffer will elute. Number C proteins with P i is equal to P h of the buffer will elute and number D none of the above. So, which of the following statement is true regarding in um, uh, that uh, regarding that uh, if uh, in ion exchange chromatography is column is negatively charged then what will happen? Again read the options very carefully think what happens in a ion exchange chromatography and then identify the correct answer. I will give you some time I will give you 2 to 3 minutes. After checking your answer, I will uh, discuss this ion exchange chromatography in detail and I will discuss what of the following answer will be the correct one. In ion exchange chromatography if column is negatively charged then which of the following statement is true?
let me check if there are any answers for problem number 7. Negative loss ok, I have answers number B, number A, resin means positively charged proteins will bind. So, A will be the answer less P i is positively less charge A ok. Let us see if A number is the correct one or not. So, the correct answer will be very good it is number A and very good with the explanation your explanation is completely correct whatever you have uh, told in the chat box ok it is a very good explanation which you have uh, answered. So, I am very happy that you have understood the ion exchange chromatography properly. So, now let me uh, just discuss it little bit. So, the correct answer was number A proteins with pi less than pH of buffer will elute. So, what, uh, what it means in the ion exchange chromatography? So, in ion exchange chromatography what happens? The column that particular uh, stationary phase it has a particular ion. It might either it can be um, positively charged or it can be negatively charged ok. And the now uh, in the last class we have discussed about the isoelectric points of the protein right. We have discussed that in the isoelectric point the part the total charge of the protein is the neutral it is it does not contain any net charge. But if the nitro the, there is a particular pH of a buffer and if the pH based on the pH of buffer the particular protein have particular um, uh, charge. So, if the pi of the protein is less than the pH of buffer it will be negatively charged. Okay, and if the proteins with the PIs are greater than pH of the buffer, it will be positively charged. And so, if your column or your stationary phase in the ion exchange chromatography is negatively charged, suppose it is negatively charged. Now, if the your protein is positively charged, so what will happen? It will bind strongly with that particular stationary phase which is negatively charged, and it will not elute. And the uh, the protein, and uh, if it is negatively charged, the particular no, your particular protein is itself negatively charged it will not bind with the negatively charged resin and it will elute first right. Uh, so, now uh, so if the pi so I have discussed in the last class also it has in the PPT that proteins when the pi is less than the pH it will get negatively charged ok. So, now the question is the column is negatively charged now the if the proteins are uh, proteins have pi is less than ph it will itself get negatively charged so it will not bind to the negatively charged column so what will happen it will elute first right and if the protein is positively charged it will happen when the pi is uh, greater than ph okay so what will happen the protein will positively charge and it will bind strongly with the our um, uh, uh, strongly with our column and it will not elute so, the correct answer was number A, the proteins with pi less than pH of the buffer will elute since it will be the proteins then it will be negatively charged, it will not bind to the negatively charged uh, column and it will elute. So, very good the explanation and I think um, I have uh, others have also identified the correct answer. So, very good ok. So, now I will move toward the next problem. So, problem number 8, it says that which of the following? statements is false regarding the determination of the 3D structure of proteins. Your options are number A, best way is to crystallize the protein, number B NMR can also provide the static conformation of proteins, number C cryo electron microscope can directly show the image no need for crystallization, number D for NMR highly concentrated solution are required. So, which of the following statement is false regarding the determination of 3D structure of protein? Your options are number A, best way to crystallize a protein. Number B, NMR can also provide the static conformation of proteins. Number C, cryo electron microscope can directly show the image, no need for crystallization. And number D, for NMR, highly concentrated solutions are required. I will give you 2 to 3 minutes. Read all the options carefully and let me know in the chat box which of the following statement is false for the determination of 3D structure of proteins. Which of the following statements is false for determination of 3D structure of proteins? Let me know in the chat box all of you. I want all of you to participate now.
let me check the chat box okay i have only one answer number c okay let me check if number c is the correct one others also please try to answer the questions okay let me check which of the following will be the correct answer for problem number 8 so it was the 7 so the correct answer for problem number 8 which of the following statement is false regarding determination of 3d structure of proteins will be number b nmr can also provide the static conformation of protein this statement is false so let first let us understand why determination of 3d structure of proteins are important so 3d structures are precious sources of information of the shape and domain structure protein classification prediction of the function of uncharacterized proteins interaction with other macromolecules interaction with small ligands metal ions nucleotides substrates cofactor inhibitors evidence for enzyme mechanism structure based drug development post translation modification like disulfide bond in glycosylation and experimental evidence for transmembrane domain so these are the requirements or for the determination of 3d structure of proteins since the 3d structure of proteins are the source of this particular um, informations which are very important so regarding the 3d structure of the protein there are different techniques to determine the 3d structure of protein one way best way is the x-ray crystallography if you can isolate a crystal structure of a protein then it is the ultimate structural evidence methods of the determined to complete uh, the 3d structure usually there are three types one is extra crystallography that is the most reliable one then is the nmr spectroscopy very high field nmr machine is required and through nmr spectroscopy one can determine the 3d structure of protein or however there are some disadvantages of NMR spectroscopy. Okay, uh, the you cannot handle very large molecules in NMR, but at the same time there are some advantages as well. In X-ray crystallography, if you cannot crystallize a protein, you cannot build the structure. X-ray crystallography needs crystal, the structure is the static one, and we get the average structure in the crystal. Okay, but the NMR is recorded in solution, so you can see exactly the dynamics of the system but you need the highly concentrated solution to get the signals the peaks are very complicated ones and you should have isotopically labeled carbon isotopically labeled nitrogen and the techniques to do that but by nmr you can do the structural analysis but not very large proteins it is a limit and up to 60 kilo dalton you can do the structural elucidation so the op problem number option number b it has said that nmr can also provide the static conformation of protein which is not x-ray crystallography can give you the static in uh, confirmation because it is the stagnant one okay but the nmr it is recorded in the solution phase so in the solution phase you know the molecules they remove uh, the here and there there is a structural conformation changes every time so it is basically the dynamic system okay so nmr records the dynamic structure of the system not the static one that is why number b is the incorrect statement okay so now i will move toward the next problem so problem number nine says which of the following statement regarding enzyme is not true your options are number A, enzymes are one kind of protein, number B, they can change the rate of the reaction, number C, they get consumed in the course of reaction and number D, they are site specific in nature. So this question is regarding enzymes and I, I know it is very easy question and all of you can answer it clear, uh, I mean correctly. So I will give you two minutes and then I will check the chat box, identify the statement which is uh, regarding enzyme which is not true. Number A enzymes are one kind of proteins number b they can change the rate of the reaction number c they can uh, they get consumed in the course of the reaction and number d they are site specific in nature so which of the following statement uh, is not true I know all of you can answer it correctly because it is very easy and basic question regarding enzyme.
let me check the chat box now. Okay, again only one answer which is number C. Others please participate, you have to answer the questions, okay, otherwise I won't understand that you are following the class or not. Okay, let me check if number C is the correct answer of problem number 9. So, the correct answer will be number C, they get consumed in the course of the reaction, this statement is not true. So, what are the enzymes? The enzyme is a basically a protein with catalytic properties due to its power of specific activation. Biological systems are sensitive uh, to the temperature change, increase of the rate of the reaction without increasing the temperature, increase the rate by lowering the activation energy. They create a new reaction pathway and they are the globular proteins with complex 3D structure and active site is where the reaction is catalyzed. So, basically this is an enzyme. And in every enzyme, there is a particular space or there is a particular pocket where the substrate binds. After binding of the substrate, what happens? The reaction happens or the, the product formation, it happens, okay. But uh, after the product formation, the particular enzyme, it is released and it is, it do not, it does not get consumed or there is no change of the active site. After one substrate molecule is catalyzed and the product is formed, another substrate will can come and join uh, the enzyme to the active site and uh, another product formation can happen. So, in this course, this particular um, uh, particular enzyme does not get consumed and they uh, actually, this is the uh, particular graph of demonstrating the stabilization of the particular uh, the reaction transition, okay. So, this is the free energy which is in the y axis and the reaction progress in the x axis. So, the starting material has to cross a particular energy barrier which is the activation energy and after reaching for reaching the transition state. After crossing the transition state, the product formation happens and this is known as the activation energy which is must be required uh, acquired to have a reaction. But what happens when with enzyme, the with enzyme this activation energy barrier gets lowered as you can see there is a new transition state and new pathway through which the reaction proceeds now with the class act activation energy. So, we have a much faster rate of the reaction. So, this is the graphical uh, representation how a particular enzyme catalyzed the reaction, okay. So, now I will move toward the next problem. So, all of you please uh, um, participate, okay, in the answering the questions. So, problem number 10 says which of the following statement is not true for Km and Vmax. Vmax is the maximum rate at which a particular enzyme catalyzed reaction can proceed. A small value of Km tells us that the enzyme binds strongly to its substrate. Number C, Km is the concentration of substrate at which the rate of the reaction reaches Vmax. And number D, large value of Km tells us that the energy, the enzyme shows a little specificity for the given substrate. So, which of the following statement is not true regarding Km and Vmax? So, Vmax is the maximum velocity or rate of the reaction of an enzyme catalyzed reaction and uh, particular uh, Km is the my known as also the Michaelis Menten constant. So, now you have to find out which of the following statement is not true regarding Km and Vmax. Which of the following statement is not true regarding Km and Vmax?
let me check the chat box now okay number a number a is the only given answer okay let me check if it is correct or not see the question was which of the following statement is not true right so the untrue statement is number c km is the concentration of a substrate at which the rate of reaction reaches vmax this statement is not true statement number 1 is correct vmax is the maximum rate at which a particular enzyme catalyst reaction can proceed so now let me show you the graph so it is known as michaelis menten curve okay so all we know that this is the michaelis menten equation um, the, there is a uh, um, equation which is a michaelis menten equation for the enzyme catalysis okay which says us about the velocity of the reaction enzyme catalyst reaction so this is the graph of that particular reaction here as you can see in the y axis we have the rate of the reaction and in the x axis we have the substrate concentration okay so in in the initial phases uh, so the reaction uh, is the first order kinetics in the middle of portion it is the mixed order kinetics and in the end portion it is the zero order kinetics so it is the uh, position of so vmax is the maximum rate at which the particular enzyme catalyst reaction can proceed so one, what is the km or which is the what is the michaelis menten constant it is the concentration of the particular substrate at which the rate of the reaction reaches the vmax by 2 okay so remember km is the substrate concentration now when the particular rate of the reaction uh, reaches to the uh, half of the maximum of or vmax by 2 a small value of km what it does it do it tells us about the particular uh, so as you can see uh, the small value it says that the, the enzyme binds strongly to the substrate okay so the small value of km it tells us that the enzyme binds strongly to the substrate and the large value of km means that the enzyme shows little specificity for the given substrate and this is the michaelis menten equation uh, based on which this curve is generated v0 equal to vmax into substrate concentration divided by km plus s where v0 is the initial velocity in the moles per time s is the substrate concentration in molar vmax is the maximum velocity and km is the substrate concentration at half vmax okay so statement number c was incorrect one so now next problem so problem number 11 says which of the following statements is true about two dimensional electrophoresis your options are number a proteins are separated uh, on the basis of charge number b proteins are separated on the basis of molecular weight number c proteins are separated on the basis of pi and number d proteins are separated on the basis of both molecular weight and pi so which of the following statement is true regarding the two dimensional electrophoresis again i will repeat problem option a proteins are separated on the basis of charge number b proteins are separated on the basis of molecular weight number c proteins are separated on the basis of pi and number d proteins are separated on the basis of both molecular weight and pi so which of the following statement is true regarding the two dimensional electrophoresis
let me check the chat box ok so I have few answers number C number D and number C so I have three different answers for this question so let me check which of the following is the correct one so the correct answer will be number D proteins are separated on the basis of both molecular weight and the isoelectric points so in the 2D gel elect, um, uh, the 2D uh, uh, two dimensional pro, uh, in the um, proteins are separated as per isoelectric point and the um, uh, protein mass separation of the proteins by isoelectric point is known as the isoelectric focusing or IEF and when a gradient of pH is applied to a gel and the electrical potential is applied across the gel making one positive and other negative and at all the pH values other than their isoelectric points protein will be charged if they are positively charged they will pull toward the negative end of the gel and if they are negatively charged they will be pulled to the positive end of the gel the proteins applied in the first dimension will move along with the gel and will accumulate at their isoelectric point that is the point at which the overall charge on the protein is 0 at a neutral charge in the separating protein by mass the gel treated with sodium dodecyl sulfate SDS along with the other reagents SDS page in 1D the de denatures the protein and then unfolds them into the long straight molecule and binds the number of SDS molecule roughly proportional to the protein's length because a protein's length is roughly proportional to its mass SDS molecules are negatively charged and as a result there are all proteins have approximately same mass to charge ratio so basically what happens first now it is called the two dimensional because the proteins are separated two times so first in first dimension we have the isoelectric focusing which is based on the pi ok based on the isoelectric point and then the pH of the buffer the proteins will be negatively or positively charged and based on that charge they will be separated in the isoelectric focusing now what happens in the isoelectric focusing gel is placed in a SDS or polyacrylamide gel and we all know that SDS in the second dimension it um, it will change the it will uh, separate the protein based on their molecular weights right so what happens in the second dimensional they, they are decreasing the molecular weight and then the, we have this two dimensional it is known because it is based on both molecular weight and based on molecular and the pi so the first uh, the um, uh, separation will be based on the pi which is known as isoelectric focusing and the second one is the sds page where the separation will be based on their molecular weight okay so the statement number d was the uh, true regarding the two dimensional electrophoresis now i will move toward the next problem so problem number 12 says in michaelis maintain equation at high substrate concentration the rate of the reaction becomes uh, becomes number a second order with respect to the substrate concentration number b zero order with respect to the substrate concentration number c first order with respect to the substrate concentration and number d zero order with respect to the enzyme concentration which of the following will be the correct one in michaelis maintain equation at high substrate concentration the rate of the reaction becomes say, uh, becomes second order zero order first order or zero order with respect to enzyme concentration i have shown you and i have also told this uh, in the last to last question if you have paid attention to the question i know all of you can answer this question correctly In Michaelis Menten equation at high substrate concentration, rate of the reaction becomes which of the following will be the correct answer?
let me check the chat box okay i have few answers one says it is first order then c then number d and then number c number c d number c so i have three number c and one number d okay so okay no no this is i think for the previous one so i have only one answer which says it is the number c let me check if it is the correct one or not so the question has said that in michaelis menten equation at high substrate concentration the rate of the reaction becomes the answer will be number b zero order with respect to the substrate concentration now let me show you the michaelis menten curve once more so this is the michaelis menten equation curve okay so the velocity of the reaction is in the y axis the substrate concentration is the x axis so this is the curve at the beginning when the substrate concentration is low so what happens there is a first order kinetics followed okay the rate of the reaction is first order with respect to the substrate concentration in between in the middle portion it is the mix order and at the high substrate concentration when all the so enzymes are occupied by the substrate it is the saturated it is the became the zero order with respect to the substrate concentration you also can find it out from the michaelis menten equation itself so we all know that the michaelis menten equation is the v0 equal to what it is the v max i am writing it as vm into the substrate concentration divided by km which is the michaelis menten equation plus s right so this is the michaelis menten equation so when the so uh, let us uh, first understand so when the substrate concentration is very high so when the substrate concentration is much much greater than km what will happen in the denominator the km will be less than the substrate concentration so we can neglect the km from the denominator so what will happen is the v0 will become your vm or v max into the substrate concentration divided by substrate concentration so it get cancel out so we get v0 equal to v max or vm means at the high substrate concentration when s is much much greater than km what happens that v0 becomes v max and we don't have any now it becomes zero order with respect to the substrate concentration but when the opposite happens means when the km is much much greater than the substrate concentration so what will happen we cannot neglect this uh, now we can neglect the substrate concentration in the denominator so our equation becomes v0 equal to vm by km into substrate concentration means our equation becomes first order with respect to the substrate concentration so remember whenever the um, uh, the particular substrate concentration is very high we can ignore the substrate concentration in denominator and reaction becomes zero order and the opposite is same whenever when the km is much much greater than the substrate concentration okay so that's how you can find it uh, if you don't remember it at the point of the if you don't remember the particular thing at the point of the examination you can find it out from the michaelis menten equation itself that is why remembering the michaelis menten equation is very very important okay because most of your problems will be solved if you remember this particular michaelis menten equation you can find the other answers with from this equation itself so now i will go to the next problem problem number 13 says identify the incorrect statement number a in the interior of globular protein hydrophobic amino acids are present number b hydrophilic amino acids stay in the interior of a globular protein number c valine will reside on the interior surface and number d globular proteins are water soluble so identify the incorrect statement regarding the globular proteins again i will repeat number a in the interior of globular protein hydrophobic amino acids are present number b hydrophilic amino acids stay in the interior of globular protein number c valine will reside on the interior surface and number d globular proteins are water soluble so which of the following statement is incorrect regarding the uh, globular protein again i will give you some time and then i will show you the correct answer which of the following statement is incorrect regarding globular proteins
let me check if there are any answers okay i have several answers yeah zero order is was the correct one so number d number b number b so i have one number d and two number b as the answers of this particular question okay let me check if it is correct or not which of the following is the correct one so the correct answer will be yeah number b statement number b is incorrect regarding the globular protein hydrophilic amino acid do not stay in the interior of globular protein so first let us understand the classification of amino acid based on their polarity so the non polar ones are the glycine alanine valine cysteine proline leucine isoleucine methionine tryptophan and phenyl so these are non polar so there are the polar can be divided into three part it can be uncharged which are the serine threonine tyrosine asparagine glutamine so this particular amino acids are polar but they do not contain any charge the charged amino acid the hydrophilic ones okay the polar amino acids are considered as hydrophilic and non polar are considered as hydrophobic so hydrophilic amino acids can be polar which are this one the charged polar which can be the positively charged which have the lysine arginine and histidine and negatively charged is the aspartic and glutamic acid so now about the globular proteins so they are named for their approximately spherical shapes and are most abundant proteins in nature the globular proteins exist in an enormous variety of three dimensional structure nearly all globular proteins contain substantial number of alpha helices and beta sheets folded into a compact structure that is stabilized by both polar and non polar interaction globular three dimensional structures uh, form spontaneously and is maintained as a result of interaction among the side chains of amino acid most often the hydrophobic amino acid side chains are buried closely packed in the interior of globular protein out of the contact of water hydrophilic amino acid side chains right lie on the surface of the globular protein exposed in the water consequently globular proteins are usually very soluble in aqueous solution the diversity of the protein structure reflects remarkably variety of the function performed by the globular proteins the binding catalysis regulation transport immunity and cellular signaling okay so option number b was the incorrect statement so now i will uh, go to the next problem problem number 14 is a mathematical question which is very easy i think all of you can do it what is the ratio of v0 v max when the substrate concentration equal to 3 km your options are number a 3 by 8 number b 3 by 7 number c 5 by 7 and number d 3 by 4 i will give you 2 to 3 minute try to do it quickly and it is very easy i know all of you can do it so try what is the ratio of v0 by v max when substrate concentration is 3 km What is the ratio of V zero by V max when substrate concentration equal to three km? let me check the chat box <clears throat> okay 
Okay, I have one answer which says it is 3 by 4. Others, I think you have not tried it. Okay, I will show you how to do this kind of problems, which is very easy to solve, by the way. So, the correct answer will be 3 by 4, very good. Whoever have an answer, very good. So, it is very easy how to solve. So, this is the Michaelis Menten equation. We all know V0 equal to V max into subset concentration divided by Km plus S subset concentration, where V0 is initial velocity, uh, S is the subset concentration, V max is maximum velocity, and Km is the subset concentration at the half V max. So, the question it says that now what is the V0 by V max ratio when S equal to 3 Km? So, what you have to do is you only you have to substitute the subset concentration with 3 km in this particular equation. So, if you do it, so what will happen if you take the V max to the left hand side, what will happen? You will get V0 by V max which is asked in the question and you have the subset concentration divided by km plus subset concentration. Now, if you replace the S subset concentration with 3 km, so what we will have 3 km divided by km plus 3 km and we will have 3 km by 4 km, so where km km cancel out and we have 3 by 4. So, the ratio of V0 by V max equal to 3 by 4. So, this is a very easy question. This kind of question can be given to the mathematical questions. So, just uh, uh, so remember the Michaelis Menten equation, replace the values and you will get the correct answer, right. So, now I will go to the next problem. Problem number 15 says which of the following statement is false regarding the induced fit hypothesis? Your options are number A, the substrate specificity range is very high, number B, the active side is rigid, number C more accepted model for enzyme substrate complex than lock and key theory and number D conformational changes occur in enzyme and substrate. So, which of the following statement is false regarding the induced fit hypothesis? So, there are very two popular hypothesis regarding the enzyme catalysis, one is known as the lock and theory and another one is the induced fit hypothesis. So, in lock and key theory basically it is uh, said that uh, the particular enzyme and the substrate they are basically like lock and key. So, the enzyme is like the lock, it has a particular position uh, which is exactly fits a particular substrate which is a just looks like a key, ok. So, one particular uh, substrate can bind to only one particular enzyme uh, as we have only one particular key for a particular lock. So, that is the lock and key theory basically and another is the induced fit hypothesis. The following first you identify the, the false statement regarding this, this hypothesis among these four, then I will discuss it. Let me check the chat box now. Okay, I have few answers I think. Number B and number D. So, I have two different answer. One thinks it is number B and one thinks it is number D. Let me check which of the following is the correct one. So, the correct answer is number B. The active side is rigid. This statement is false regarding the induced fit hypothesis. So, what happens during induced fit hypothesis? We have an enzyme, we have an active site and conformational changes happen in en both enzyme and substrate. That conformational changes will make the enzyme suitable, the active site suitable for the substrate. Okay, so, whenever the substrate is in the vicinity of the enzyme, the based on the um, uh, shape of the substrate, the active site uh, of the enzyme changes a little bit 
uh, so that the substrate get fits into the enzyme and we get the product. So, the substrate specificity for this enzyme um, inducive hypothesis is very high, but the active side is not rigid, it is flexible so that the conformational changes can happen. It is the more accepted model for enzyme substrate complex than lock and key theory and the conformation changes occur in enzyme and substrate. Okay, so, statement number B was the false one. So, now next problem, problem number 16 says that fibrous and globular protein are associated with dash and dash structure of the proteins respectively, you have to fill in the blanks. Number A secondary primary, number B primary tertiary, number C secondary tertiary and number E tertiary secondary. So, the fibrous and globular proteins are associated with which particular structures of the protein? Number A fibrous with secondary, globular with primary, number B fibrous with primary, uh, globular with tertiary. Number C, fibrous with secondary, globular with tertiary and number D, fibrous with tertiary and globular with secondary. Identify the correct answer. The fibrous and globular proteins are associated with which particular structures of the proteins? Let me check the chat box. <coughs> okay, so I have received the answer of number C and number B. So, number C and number B are the two answers. Let me check which of the following is the correct one. So, the correct answer will be number C secondary and tertiary. Fibrous proteins are associated with the secondary structure and tertiary ones are associated with the uh, globular proteins. So, fibrous protein when an amino acids are joined to make a straight chain and make a fibrous and sheet like structure is known as fibrous protein and when the polypeptide chain of amino acid become folded and makes a globular structure or uh, as a ring and spherical it is known as the globular protein. So, what are the differences and the um, similarity and differences? So, fibrous proteins are a class of insoluble proteins which constitute a main structural elements of our body okay and uh, like hair skin okay and the globular proteins are the soluble proteins soluble in water that tend to involve in metabolic function like enzymes and all the fibrous protein has a long and narrow shape globular one has a round and spherical shape fibrous protein have a helical sheet like structure globular ones have the folded ball like structure and the fibrous protein in the secondary structure and the second uh, third tertiary structure associated with the globular protein it consists of a respective amino repetitive amino acid sequence, uh, globular protein consists of an irregular amino acid sequence. The fibrous proteins are insoluble in water acids and bases, the globular protein are soluble in water acid and bases. Fibrous protein have a strong intermolecular interaction, globular protein have weaker intermolecular interaction. Fibrous proteins are less sensitive to the changes of the temperature and pH, the globular protein are sensitive to the changes in the temperature and pH. Fibrous ones are involved in forming structure, the globular proteins are involved in metabolic reaction. 
For example, collagen, elastin, actin, myosin, fibrin, keratin, the things are found in the skin here is this kind of proteins are an example of fibrous protein and enzyme, hormones, hemoglobin, immunoglobin, these are example of the globular protein. Okay? So, number C was the correct one. So, problem number 17, it says which of the which is the unit of the turnover number of an enzyme? Your options are number A concentration per time, number B time inverse, number C concentration inverse and number D time uh, by concentration. Which of the following is the correct unit of the turnover number of an enzyme? Number A concentration per time, number B time inverse, number C concentration inverse and number D time per concentration. Identify the correct uh, unit of turnover number of an enzyme and let me know. Let me check the chat box. Okay, there is no answer till now. Okay, let me check. Okay, what is the correct answer? And then I will tell you what is the turnover number of an enzyme. So the correct answer will be the unit of turnover number of an enzyme is number B time inverse. So what is the turnover number? So turnover number also termed as K in the uh, your uh, k cat uh, is defined as the maximum number of the chemical conversions of a substrate molecule per second that um, a single catalytic site will execute for a given enzyme concentration okay so it is the maximum number of chemical conversion of a substrate molecules per second that is uh, a single catalytic site will execute for a given enzyme concentration okay so, K cat equal to V max by E t. Uh, for example, carbonic anhydrase has a turnover number of um, 4 lakh to 6 lakh second inverse, which means that each carbonic anhydrase enzyme molecule can produce up to 6 lakh molecules of the product that is the bicarbonate ion per second. Okay? So, this is the turnover number. We will discuss the turnover number in more detail in the next lecture in the next uh, because in the next week class we have the turnover number in more detail. So, now problem number 18, it says that an example of oxido reductase enzyme is your options are number A fumarase, number B lysozyme, number C lactate dehydrogenase and number D RNA polymerase. So, what is the, which of the following is the example of oxido reductase? An example of oxido reductase is, is which of the following will be the correct answer? An example of oxido reductase enzyme is number A fumarase, number B lysozyme, number C lactate dehydrogenase and number D RNA polymerase. Let 
me check the chat box. Okay, number D is given answer and you are confused, it is fine. Let me check if it is the correct one or not. So, the correct answer will be lactate dehydrogenase. So, oxidoreductase is basically as the name suggests, this enzymes will perform the oxidation and reduction. Okay. So, as you can see lactate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase means it will remove the hydrogens from the substrate, okay. dehydrogenase. So, means it is a way of the reduct oxidation and reduction. So, this is an example of oxidation reduction. So, the, the, this is the oxidoreductase family. Okay, so, there are different different enzymes, the oxygenases or oxidoreductase, they incorporate oxygen into the organic molecule, uh, peroxidases that reduction of hydrogen peroxide into hydro and hydroperoxides, reductases they catalyze the reduction, dehydrogenases oxidize substance by transforming one or more hydride ions, oxidases oxygen as the hydrogen or electron acceptor and hydrolysis add hydroxyl group to the substrate. So, these are the uh, examples of the oxidoreductase family which is a huge uh, family of the uh, enzymes okay, and this is these are different enzymes which falls into the category of oxidoreductase uh, which will perform oxidation and reduction uh, kind of reactions. Okay. Problem number 19 it says in which family of enzyme does lysozyme enzyme belong? Number A ligase, number B hydrolase, number C isomerase and number D transferase. Which in which family of enzymes does the lysozyme enzyme belong? Identify the correct answer. Ligase, hydrolase, isomerase, transferase. In which family of enzymes does lysozyme enzyme belong? Let me check since we are short of time and so let me check. Okay. Number B is the given answer. Let me check if it is the correct one or not. So, the correct answer will be number B, very good, hydrolysis. So, basically there are several uh, examples and of enzyme classes like oxidoreductase. They perform oxidation reduction, example lactate dehydrogenase, transferase, they perform the moving of the chemical group like hexokinase, hydrolysis, hydrolysis, bond cleavage with the transfer of functional group of water, example is lysozyme, ligases, non-hydrolytic bond cleavage, example is fumarase, isomerase, intramolecular group transfer or isomerization, example triose phosphate isomerase and ligases synthesis of a new covalent bond between substrate and using ATP hydrolysis example RNA polymerase. So, these are the enzyme classes, these are the reaction type and examples they perform. Okay. So, the last question of today's session it says that the line weaver bark plot is associated with number A, a straight line with a slope of minus k m by v max, number B parabola with a intercept of 1 by v max, number C a straight line with a slope of k m by v max and number D parabola with the intercept of 1 minus 1 by v max. So, which of the following uh, is the correct one? Line weaver for uh, line weaver bark plot of enzyme catalysis. Line weaver bark plot is associated with number A straight line with the slope of minus k m by v max, number B parabola with intercept of 1 by v max, number C straight line with the slope of k m by v max and number D parabola with the intercept of minus 1 by v max.
which of the following will be the correct answer let me check the chat box if there is any answer i have answer number c okay let me check if number c is the correct one or not so the correct answer will be yes it is number c the straight line with the slope of km by v max is uh, which uh, with which the line weaver bark plot is associated with so the line weaver bark plot it is known as the recipro double reciprocal plot also so it is a problem related to the michaelis menten kinetics is that fact that it may not sufficient data points to determine whether the curve is a michaelis menten plot has reached to a particular maximum value or not this means this values of for the maximum rate and km are likely to be inaccurate more accurate values are these properties can be obtained by plotting reciprocals of the rate and the substrate concentration to give a line weaver bark plot so basically the michaelis menten equation which we have right so it is very easy to reach from the michaelis menten equation Uh, and uh, to the particular uh, line weaver bark plot so we know the rate of the reaction which is given by uh, v0 right the, or for the rate of the reaction in case of the michaelis menten equation i will give it as r equal to we all know it is the v max or vm into substrate concentration divided by km plus substrate concentration right so in the line weaver bark plot you just have to make it reciprocate so 1 by r or 1 by rate equal to it will be like km by vm into substrate concentration plus when it, you make it a reciprocal what will happen we will have 1 by v max or 1 by rate max so if you compare it with a uh, y equal to ms plus c so what you get the particular straight line you get with the slope is km by rate v max and the uh, intercept is the 1 by rate uh, 1 by rate max or 1 by v max okay so prostate a this one was the correct one so this was the today's last question so today what we'll discussed we discussed about the different secondary structure tertiary structure of the proteins we discussed about globular fibrous protein we discussed very much about the separation techniques of the protein and also we discussed about the enzymes and the enzyme kinetics so i think uh, the slides are clear and if you have any doubt and any query like always i say uh, reach me through the email id i will share my email id today also uh, so please kim uh, dot So in the chat box there is my email ID. If you have any problem, any doubt, any query about today's class or about the previous class also, you can let me know in the uh, email ID. Also you can let know, uh, let us know in the discussion forum of the particular the organic chemistry and biology drug development in the SWM portal. This class lecture and the uh, PPT I will uh, upload it. So where you have to find find it out, I will just show you. So once you have the SWM portal, right? so all of you can access the swam portal and uh, you know there is a announcement portion where the assignments are given i will just show you once here so this is your uh, swam portal and in the swam portal we have the announcement portion where the and here you will have the link to the problem solving session okay okay i think i have to just open it out once more i will show you where to find this problem solving session so you will find a google sheet so i have to sign in yeah so you will find here is a announcement portion this portion you will find there is a problem solving session if you uh, click here you will get the problem solving session recording if you click on this recording you have to click here and you will go to this kind of google sheet where you will find a youtube link and the google folder link if you click on the google folder link you will reach to a google folder where the ppt will be uploaded and today's class lecture i will upload in a new uh, i mean uh, video link and i will uh, attach it here so you can find it from there okay so i think it is clear where to find the problem solving lecture and the presentation also so now i will close the session for today thank you all for joining and answering we will meet to uh, on the next monday from the 6 pm to 8 pm class for our next uh, live session so thank you all if you have any doubt any query let me know in the this email id okay i will close the session for today thank you